Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Let's get all distractions put away, please. All right, so something like this. Now, let's, let's, we're going to kind of move forward. We did some review stuff, and you might still be working on that, and that's fine. Some of the things we'll do today will really continue with that and maybe help you get a little more practice with it. Uh, but we're going to start to focus now on, on why we're really in this chapter. What are we trying to do? And that is solve equations, solve quadratic equations. So what about something like this? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Move the x. Okay, we're going to move the x left or right? Left. Okay, so we're going to subtract x from both sides. That's good. Uh, oops, I'm frozen. Okay, so we're going to subtract x from both sides. What else while we're at it? What else might we do? Add 56, yeah. And why are we doing this? Okay, we're going to add 56 to both sides and subtract x so that we cancel everything on the right. And what do we get on the right then? Zero. On the left, we get x squared plus 16x minus x would be what? Plus 15x. And then we had zero. We add 56. We just get plus 56. Okay, this is important. This is what we call, when we set it equal to zero like this, this is, this is a quadratic equation. In standard form. Standard form means we set it equal to zero. Okay. <clears throat> now, why do we do that? It is the right thing to do. Why do we do that? So we can factor it. So we can factor it. Yeah, because now look, we've got this problem that we talked about a while ago. We got this problem here where uh, we've got you know we got to figure out what the values of x are that are going to make this whole expression equal to zero. But the only way for us really to do that is is by using that zero product property trick, right? There's more than one x here, and so it's going to be really difficult for us to just randomly pick values of x and try them. In fact, it might be impossible. I mean, if x is not an integer, if it's just some kind of uh, irrational number that's a decimal that never repeats and never terminates, you're never going to try it, right? And so we got to have a better method, right? And so our method is we're going to see if we can break this apart into two simple factors and then just find when those factors are zero. Right? So before I even think about factoring it, I can just write down the template that I'm going to use. What's that look like? Okay, so I've got to set up parentheses for my factors, and what can I add right away? X's. Yeah, I know that if it works, those have to be x's, right? And now I just have to find magic numbers. So Emma, what am I, I've got to find numbers that do two things. They have to multiply to what? 56, good, and add to? Perfect. So we got to multiply to 56 and add to 15. So what are the signs of the numbers going to be if they multiply to a positive and add to a positive? Seven yeah, they're both going to be positive. And yeah, the numbers are just 8 and 7, aren't they? Right? Those are numbers that, that multiply to 56 and add to 15. So then by the zero product property now, right? Remember, that's just kind of our fancy word for saying that the only way for things to multiply to give us zero is if they are zero, right? The only way we can get a product that equals zero is if we're multiplying by zero. So, Bailey, what's one value of x then that would work? If it's going to make one of these, I've really just got factor one and factor two, right? What's a value of x that's going to make factor 1 equal to 0? Uh, well, so we, we want the value of x that's going to make this equal 0. Right, so, so we know that x plus 8 has to equal 0. And we could set that equation up if we wanted. We know that for this factor to equal 0, we know that what's in the factor has to equal 0. And then what am I going to do to both sides to solve for x? Subtract, yeah. Subtract 8, so I get x equals negative 8. I think it's probably easier in most cases just to ask yourself, okay, what plus 8 is 0? Well, you can just kind of think, well, that'd be negative 8, wouldn't it? Because they'd have to cancel, right? What about this one? What are we going to get? 
We'll go negative 7, good. Okay, so we end up with x equals negative 8 or x equals negative 7. Those are my solutions, right? Because negative 8 is the one that's going to make the first factor equal to 0. So 0 times something else is 0. Negative 7 makes the second factor 0. So some number times 0 equals 0, right? Okay, good. So that's, that's one approach. Now, I would consider that to be you know, a harder type of problem than what you've done in the past because we couldn't just isolate x, right? We had to, we had to factor and use that zero product property. Uh, it doesn't always work, though. Let's look at this example. What would I do here, probably, first step? What am I going to do? Subtract 1 to put it in standard form. So I set it equal to 0. So 7x squared minus 3x minus 1 equals 0. But yikes. I mean, this is one where the number in front of x squared is not equal to 1. There is no greatest common factor that I could divide away from both sides, right? And so the only hope here, if I'm going to factor this, is bottoms up, right? And I would say that if you can't do it pretty easily, don't bother. I mean, if we are going to think about doing bottoms up, and it works easily, you know, if it works, what is the product of A and C? What's A? 7. C is negative, negative 1. So what's A times C? Negative 7. And what's B? Yeah, B is just the coefficient of, of x, right? So B equals negative 3. Well, is that going to work? Can we find numbers that multiply to negative 7 and add to negative 3? Yeah. We can? I don't think so. No, it's, not, if we can, they're not going to be convenient ones, right? So bottoms up doesn't work. I mean, we can't factor this one. And so for now, we're stuck. We hit a dead end. We'll have a method for doing this later in the chapter. But for now, that's one we just really can't do. Because the only technique we have is factoring. And it doesn't work. OK. So sometimes we get lucky, though, and we get easier kinds of problems to solve. Now, why is this one so much easier than the other two we just looked at? OK, there's nothing in front of the x squared. We had the same thing going on there, right? We still had a 1 in front of the x squared. But this one is still easier. I mean, look what we started with here compared to this one. There's one real distinction here that makes this one a lot easier. There's only one. Oh, yeah, there's only one x up there that I can point to, right? Here, here is a value of x, and it's the only one. And what do we always say? If I can point to a single x, I can, I, I can solve for it or I can isolate it, right? I can always isolate x to solve for x by just working backwards through order of operations, right? So now let's just let's rehearse. I mean, we, we kind of I throw this one up here a lot, but let's remind ourselves what this means. It means that the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to undo any loose addition or subtraction, any addition or subtraction that's not connected inside parentheses or anything. It's inside a function, right? Then after that, we move up and try to undo any loose multiplication or division. Then we undo any exponents. And finally, we get the stuff inside parentheses. Right? But this is pretty straightforward. What's really the only thing I have to do, or two things. What's the first thing I'd have to do to get the x by itself? Yeah, i got to go to the add subtract step and subtract 5. right? So if we subtract 5 from both sides, we're going to get x squared, and what's 14 minus 5? 9. OK. Now what? So the next step, there's really no multiplication to deal with. We can skip through that. But Eli, what did we run into here? What's the next next step? What do you think? Got to get rid of the exponent. Yeah, that's our next step, is get rid of the exponent. How do I undo squared? Square root. Sure. So I'll square root both sides. Now, there's, there's a really important step here that I can't emphasize enough. Because if you miss these problems, this is almost certainly going to be the step where you make a mistake. Uh, what's that give us? The square root of x squared, I guess you could say that undoes the squared. And I get x equals 3, except we're missing something really important there. If I square root both sides of an equation, what do I have to do? Plus or minus. I have to add a plus or minus. If I'm solving an equation, I'm solving for a variable by taking an even root of both sides, I always have to include a plus or minus. 
Okay, why is that? I'm going to show you the missing steps, right? Usually in math, we would just always go from there down to that answer. And that's, that's fine to show just exactly that work. But what's, what's missing there? Well, if I square root both sides, I want you to think for a second about what this is really doing. The square root of x squared. Just focus on that function for a second. If I have f of x equals the square root of x squared, let's just let's evaluate that for a couple numbers and see what happens. What if I evaluate that at x equals 3? I'm going to get uh, the square root of 3 squared. What's 3 squared? 9. And what's the square root of 9? 3. So I get f of 3 equals 3. I input 3, and it gives me back 3. Big deal. Let's try f of negative 4. Okay, I'm going to input a negative 4. So I'm going to square it and then square root it. What is negative 4 squared? Positive 16. What's the square root of 16? 4. Hmm. So I input a positive, and it didn't do anything. It left it alone. I input a negative, and it made it positive. What function do we know that does exactly that? We've worked with it a lot. Absolute value. Yeah, right? That's what an absolute value function does. Right? That's all it does. You put in a positive, doesn't change anything. Put in a negative, and it multiplies by negative 1 to make it positive, right? So what that tells us is the square root of x squared, and this really is the definition of absolute value. This is equal to the absolute value of x. Now, the square root of 9 is really just 3, right? But think about how we solve an absolute value equation. You've had a lot of experience with this now. If I have the absolute value of something, just say the absolute value of hand is equal to 3, then what are the two equations we trade that for? Right? We have to Remember, we have to do, we can't solve an absolute value equation. We trade it for two regular equations. So what's inside the absolute value which is an x in this case, is either going to equal what? Yeah, it's either going to equal 3 or negative 3, right? And so that's where we get that plus or minus. You don't have to go through those steps every time, but they're there behind the scenes. So we have to include that plus or minus, OK? Does that make sense? All right. So what about one like this? What would I do? What are, if I'm going to ice, I can isolate x, can't I? There's a single x there. So that's all I've really got to do is just isolate that x. Angelica, what's going to be the first step to get that x by itself? Uh, add, one. add one. Good. So first, working bottom up, you know, order of operations. First, I've got to do the addition subtraction. So I get x squared equals. 27. Cassidy, what's next? Square root. Square root it. Good. So that's going to give me x equals. <coughs> but before you even think about the number, what do you have to include? Plus the thingies. Thingies. I take that to mean a plus or minus. Yep. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So plus or minus the square root of 27. Square root of 27 is the correct answer. But it's not simplified, is it? Right? What's our goal whenever we're simplifying a radical? We want to do what to the number in the radical? Make it as small as we can. Right? And our, our vehicle for doing that is we're going to see if we can find a perfect square factor of what's inside. Is 27 a perfect square? It's not. So all we have to do is just look on the list from half of 27 up. Half of 27 is like 13.5, right? So that would be between the 9 and the 16. So all we got to do is just work our way up from there. We'll work bottoms up to see to try the biggest ones first, right? Uh, does 9 go into 27? It does. Yeah, it does. So then we could rewrite this as plus or minus. I want to put the perfect square first, don't I? Right? Because that's going to turn into a whole number. So I've got the square root of 9, because that's the biggest perfect square factor of 27, times square root of what? 3. 9 times 3 is 27. And so that gives us plus or minus, square root of 9 is 
3, radical 3. So those are our two answers. Right now in Moodle, when it asks you to input the solution separated by a comma, I wouldn't just put plus or minus, I would put the you know, 3 radical 3, comma, negative 3 radical 3, right? Okay, questions? Okay, so there's just a little practice with simplifying radicals, stuff you've been working on. Okay, let's get a little bit more complicated. How about something like this? This is maybe one step harder. How come? Can I point to a single X? Okay, Mallory, could I do something to maybe get a single X up there? I could. I could bring the X squared to the left. Good. Because those are like terms, aren't they? They're both, we tell if they're like terms by just looking at the power of X, right? They're both X squared terms. So I could subtract <coughs> X squared from both sides, and that's going to give me 2X squared minus X squared is what? X squared. So X squared plus 5, the X squareds go away, equals negative 11. Okay, so Bailey, what's next then? If I want to isolate X, what's the first thing I'm going to do to get the X by itself? Five. Subtract 5, good. So we'll subtract 5 from both sides. Those cancel. I get x squared equals negative 16. OK, what's going to be next there, Everett? What am I going to do now? Uh, square root. I'm going to square root both sides. Good. So I know when I square root both sides, it's going to turn the x squared into an x. Before I even think about anything, what do I, Vanessa, what do I have to include? Plus or minus. Plus or minus. Okay. And then I've got the square root of negative 16. Well, what's weird about that? That seems like that's something, there's a problem there, right? What are the two things, there's two rules for real numbers, and we've talked about them before, we'll talk about them again. Can't divide by what? can't ever divide by the number 0, right? That's undefined. And I can't take an even root, you know, like a square root is a second root. That's an even root. I can't take an even root of what? A negative number. If I want to get a real number answer. So I know right away that my answers are not going to be real numbers. They're not going to be the kinds of numbers I've ever worked with. But they actually are numbers. And so we're going to go a step further today than you've ever gone, and we're going to look at, at what they actually, what do we get? They're not real numbers, but how would we write them? Okay, so here's how we deal with this. We, I can break this into, just like we did before, like we even did today, we can think of a square root of a product. I can break that apart into the product of the separate square roots. Like we did the square root of 27 equals the square root of 9 times the square root of 3, for example, right? This time, let's take the square root of negative 16, and let's write that as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 16. Okay? Well, the square root of 16 is just 4, right? But what in the world is this? The square root of negative 1. The square root of negative 1 is not a real number. It's what we call an imaginary number. The definition of the square root of negative 1 is that it's equal to i. It's called the imaginary unit, and that's, that's how we deal with it, right? We just change, we exchange the square root of 1 for an i. <coughs> for now, that's a really simple step that you just have to remember to do. If I ever see a negative inside the radical, that's going to become what? Outside the radical. I, right? Because that negative means negative 1 times. You see what I'm saying? So we can trade this for we can just trade this for plus or minus the square root of positive 16 times i. Simple step, right? We just take the negative out, make it an i, and then we, we turn the argument of the square root, you know, what's inside into a positive. What's the square root of 16? 4. four. So our answer is x equals plus or minus 4 i. Okay, that's weird. That's weird. That's not what you're used to dealing with. 
uh, and you know this is what we call an imaginary number. That's a really <coughs> bad word for it, though. It really is because it makes it gives you the impression that it's it's just you know it's not real. It's nothing. It's there's no. It's not important at all. Yes. Aren't all numbers technically imaginary? No, all numbers are complex, and we'll talk about that today. But they're not imaginary. <laughs> uh, it, we'll we'll get to that here very shortly. Uh, but what I want to just I want to let you know here just right away so you don't yes. Are we gonna have to do a like radicals like that or just perfect squares? Uh, you mean like like say plus four goes into sixteen like perfectly. Oh no, you have to yeah you have to do them both. But but it's easy to do here. Let's look at one right now. What if you had this? This is uh, just so you put your mind at ease. What if you had the square root of uh, negative seventy five? Okay. Really, this isn't a big deal. If I want to simplify the square root of negative 75, what do I immediately do with the negative sign? Yeah, I just make it an i, right? That's, I just separate it into the square root of positive 75 times the square root of negative 1, which is just i, right? So the first thing we would do is just write that as the square root of 75 times i, right? And if I'm just simplifying just this radical, we don't even need a plus or minus, right? I'm just trying to find what number this is equal to. Then we would proceed to simplify this part. Is 75 a perfect square? No. Half of 75 is what? 37 and a half. So we could look at our list, and that's going to be between 36 and 49. So we just work our way up. Does 36 go into 75? No. Does 25? Yes. Yes. Right? And so we'd end up with... The square root of 25 times the square root of 20, yeah, 3, because 25 times 3 is 75, times i. <coughs> and square root of 25 is 5. five. Okay, so we get 5 times the square root of 3 times i. That's our answer. Now, there's... This is a minor thing, but mathematicians are careful about these kinds of things because math is supposed to be straightforward and it's not supposed to be ambiguous. What's maybe wrong, just in terms of like, almost like your math manners, with putting an I at the end there, putting anything after a radical, what's the only real, just kind of problem with that? What might you be wondering about? What it's going to? Well, that I, I mean, it's when you, when you write, it. say it again. It's it's well, you, you, might be, you might be wondering this. I mean, if I, like, especially if you're a messy writer like me, that I, is it included in the radical or not, right? You see what I'm saying? If you write them right next to each other, that can be hard to see. And so just as a matter of just kind of like uh, bookkeeping, you know, just to make sure we're not making silly mistakes, where could we maybe put the i instead? Because I'm really just multiplying three numbers. 5 times the square root of 3 times i. i is just a number, right? I can multiply them in any order. So where should I probably put the i, just to be safe? Yeah, in front of the radical. So I probably should write this instead as 5i times the radical 3. So does not i just mean negative? It just means the square root of negative 1. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's all it means. OK, so. Let's let's talk about this for a second then. So we've got. I, I want I want you to look closely at this. This is really important. So this is this is called a Venn diagram or a set diagram, and it's just representing how the how these three sets are related. Okay, know that everything you've ever done in math has been enclosed in this set of real numbers. Right. The set of real numbers includes <clears throat> it includes whole numbers. It includes integers. It includes you know, all the set, those are all just subsets of this set. Set of rational numbers would be anything that can be written as a fraction, right? The set of irrational numbers would be any number that can't be written as a fraction, so like a square root of 2 and pi. All of those are real numbers. They don't have i's in them. That's all you've ever dealt with. But there's a whole other universe of numbers out there called imaginary numbers, in which case we've got numbers that have i's multiplied by them, right? Uh, and both of those are actually subsets of the biggest set of numbers, the set of all possible numbers, which is called complex numbers. So complex numbers are always written this way.
all complex numbers can be written in the form a plus b times i, where a and b are real numbers. So what, what that means then is every possible complex number can be written as a real number plus a real number times i, all of them. We call the a, the part that's by itself, we call that the real part. We call the b, the number that's being multiplied by i, the imaginary part. Okay. We'll talk more about these later. For now, it's not a big deal. I mean, all you really got to do now is what we just did in that last example. But I want you to get a glimpse of this now so you can kind of see what these things are all about. Uh, all the numbers we've dealt with are technically real numbers, or our complex numbers, sorry. Uh, like the number of, how many people are in the class? I don't know, pretend there's 28 people in the class. 28 is a real number. Real numbers are mainly for counting. That's mostly what we do with our numbers. Uh, if I want to write that as a complex number, I would just write that as 28 plus 0i. Why would I do that, though? I don't need to, right? Because that's just going to go away. But every real number that you've ever dealt with is a complex number where what is true? What's the value of b? If it doesn't have an i attached to it, what must be multiplied by i? Zero. Right? So all of these real numbers down here, those are just all complex numbers where b equals 0. Okay, what about the set of pure imaginary numbers where it's, it's just a number times i? What's the value of a for those numbers? If there's no, if there's no number being added to 2i or negative 7i or a square root of 11 times i, then what, if that goes away completely, what must the value of a be? Zero, yeah. So those are just subsets. And then the set of all complex numbers would be the ones where, yeah, you have both real parts and imaginary parts, right? Does that make sense? So just to, I mean, I don't want to go into a ton of detail with this, but I want to tell you that like when I was studying physics, when I studied physics in college and in grad school, I would say that 50%, maybe more, of the problems that I ended up doing when you get to a certain level in, in engineering or science, most of what you deal with are actually complex numbers with imaginary parts. Like for example, I'll just throw a couple at you here. Like if you wanted to calculate the impedance of a circuit, of a complicated circuit, like the circuits that would be in your computer or something, it's really important to know how hard you have to push the electricity through the, through the circuit to get it to the other side. You got to know the impedance is what we call that. How much resistance is there to the flow of current through the circuit? If you want to do that, all the components of the of the circuit, all the capacitors and the inductors and the resistors and all that stuff, you'd have to take all those into account. And the only way you can do it is by giving them complex values with imaginary parts. And that's just the way it's done. If that's how it works. If you wanted to, for example, if you wanted to uh, take a, like a lens, a complicated lens system for a telephoto lens or a telescope or a microscope, and you want to be able to write that whole system of lenses as just one lens with the properties of just one lens, that's the way that it's easiest to deal with it. And once again, you've got to use these complex numbers. So if you go into those fields, you're going to see these things a lot. And they're not hard to deal with. They're just regular numbers. You just, you know, it just takes a little practice, but it's no big deal. Uh, but they're, you know, they're out there. And they, they have meaning. It's just different than what you've done in the past. OK, so let's do one more thing here. Let's try something like this. OK, this is a little harder, right? But what's my strategy going to be in solving this equation? This is the last one we'll do. Do I have to, I mean, can I, can I isolate x? I can't, right? Because I can point to a single x, I can isolate it. There might be a few more steps, but there's a single x right there, so I should be able to isolate it. Okay, we just have to work backward through maybe a few more steps. Tyler, what do you think we're going to have to do first? What do you think? Subtract 2. Subtract 2, yeah, because if we look at order of operations, you know, we don't get to parentheses until clear up there, right? 
So we're going to undo any loose addition or subtraction. Well, there's this 2 that's just that's loose. It's just being added on separately, right? So we'll subtract 2 from both sides. And we end up with 2 times the quantity x minus 3 squared <coughs> equals what on this side? Negative 16. Very good. OK, so what about? What's, what's next, you think? Carolyn, what do you think would be next here? We're trying to isolate that x. We're going to work our way up order of operations, right? <gasps> this is kind of a tricky one. I mean, you'll get it, but I think it's kind of a tricky one. You will distribute it. Okay, good. I'm glad you asked that. And you're right, you wouldn't. Uh, but that's a really common thing to do. People think a lot of times. And I understand why, because we're used to distributing. Distributing the 2 over the x and the negative 3. But I can't do that. I want to I make sure you understand why. The reason I can't do it is because of that squared. That's a red flag, right? Because x minus 3 squared is very different than x minus 3. If I were to square out the x minus 3, I would actually get x squared minus 6x plus 9, right? And so distributing to just those two terms is going to give us a different outcome when I square it. Okay, so I can't do that. You're right. That was good intuition. What now? So wouldn't that be 16? Okay, so so now I'm trying to get this x by itself, right? So if we work our way up, what's the next step? <coughs> Multiply, divide, meaning I want to undo any multiplication or division, right? So the other thing that people oftentimes want to do is they want to expand this out, right? They want to, they want to take this x minus 3 and square it out, thinking that that's multiplication, right? So if we do that, look what happens if we were to do that. I would end up with something like this, 2 times x. I'm, I'm not going to do all the steps. I just want to show you. You'll see why this isn't going to work. Okay, I just kind of ruined my whole strategy. What's wrong with that picture compared to what we had before? Because <coughs> I've got x squared and x's, so no longer do I have a single x. I can't isolate it anymore, right? So we don't want to do that either. All we want to do is we really do just want to get that x by itself. Well, the next step to get that by itself would be to undo multiplication or division. What about that 2? That 2 is being multiplied by the parentheses, right? So what would I do to undo that? What am I going to do? Yeah, divide. Divide by 2, right? Okay, so if we divide each, oops, that's all. If I divide each side by 2, and I want to be careful with this one too, because here's another common algebra <laughs> mistake. When I divide by 2, what am I going to get on the left side? It's, it's undoing that 2, isn't it? Yeah, I'm going to get x minus 3 squared. But a common thing that people want to do is they think, OK, if I'm going to divide by 2, then I've got to divide both of those factors by 2. But that's not the way it works, right? Think about what you would do with numbers. What if I had 2 times 6 divided by 2? OK, what's 2 times 6? 12. 12, right? 12 divided by 2 is 6. Right? So all we'd have to do there is just cancel those and get 6. If sometimes people want to cancel both, though, they want to write that as 2 over 2 is 1, and then 6 over 2 is 3, but 3 is the wrong answer. Right? When you cancel vertically, you're just canceling like factors, things that are being multiplied on the top and the bottom. On the bottom, the 2 is just multiplied by 1. Right? It's just by itself, but that's OK. <coughs> I can cancel things that are being multiplied on the top and the bottom, cancel like factors. But it only applies to just the twos, right? So if I look up here, I can just do this, right? And now I've gotten through that step. And so I end up with x minus 3 squared equals what? Negative 8? Yeah. OK. So what's going to be next after that? What do you think? What do you think? Kylie. Kylie back there. What do you think? What am I going to do now? i got to get that x by itself. What's my next step? I've gone through the bottom two layers of order of operations. Now what? 
I gotta undo the squared. Yeah, I'm up to exponents. How do I undo a squared? We've been doing this. <coughs> square root. But I'm square rooting the whole thing, right? Because I haven't got to parentheses yet. So if we square root both sides, that undoes the squared. What do I end up with on the left? X minus 3, because those go away, right? And I can even get rid of the parentheses now. They don't really serve a purpose anymore, right? Equals, now what about this side? What am I immediately going to do with, with that negative? I got to have a plus or minus, true. Got to have plus or minus. And then what about the negative part of the, of the negative 8? What's that, what's that become? That becomes an I, doesn't it? So we're going to have an I out there at the end, and that takes care of the negative. And then the square root of 8 is going to simplify to what? what? Is there a perfect square factor of 8? Yeah, there is. 4. Right? So square root of 8 I could write as square root of 4 times square root of 2. And what's the square root of 4? 2. And then I'll just put the radical there, how about? Right? So I'll put the I in the middle. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm gonna do one thing here. Let's do this. So what's the last step? Because really now we finally got up to the parentheses. Right? So what's the last thing we're gonna do? What do you think? Okay, so what are we gonna do? Last thing. <coughs> Subtract what? I'm trying to get the x by itself. Well, okay, so add 3 to undo the, does that make sense? So we add 3 to both sides. I'm going to put the plus 3 right there, though. I'm going to put it in front of the plus or minus. I think it's always a good idea. If there's, if there's a last step there that you're adding or subtracting something, put it in front of the plus or minus, and then look what you get. Then you end up getting the solutions, x equals 3 plus or minus, 2i times the square root of 2. So I got two solutions in one there. I've got 3 plus 2i times the square root of 2 and 3 minus 2i times the square root of 2. So in Moodle, I'd have to write them separated by a comma. I can't just put the plus or minus in there, right? Does that make sense? OK, we got it. We got a work day tomorrow. Good stuff.